You're listening to the Fearless Business Podcast. You're in the best place to learn about how to grow a business, get more clients, and make more money without fears and limitations, all while having fun in the process. Robin Waite is the founder of Fearless Business, a business accelerator helping coaches, consultants, and freelancers double their income and more. Now here's your host, Robin Waite. Welcome back, everybody. It's the next episode of the Fearless Business Podcast. I'm your host, Robin Waite, the Fearless Business Coach. I am very honored to have a guest joining us all the way from Florida today. Uh, He is Dylan Ogline. Uh, Welcome to the show, Dylan. Hey, Robin. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. It's my absolute pleasure. So uh, after growing his digital marketing agency into a seven-figure agency, generating over a million in sales annually, Dylan turned his focus to helping other people start and grow their hyper-profitable digital agencies. Dylan undoubtedly believes that anybody can start and build their own digital agency that will allow them to have more freedom and live a life with purpose and meaning. Dylan, I'm super excited to, to dive straight in and see if we can offer some value to the various coaches, consultants, and freelancers who are going to be watching this and listening in uh, on, well, in the UK, rainy Wednesday afternoon here. Uh, <laughs> Let's so do it, man. You talk about um, uh, why marketing is the number one thing that every business should be focusing on. Uh, yes. Go for it. Why is that? So uh, I believe that once you get, uh, when I'm talking about marketing, I'm, I'm basically uh, Google ads, Facebook ads, YouTube ads, things like that. Once you have that figured out where, you know, you have a positive ROI, you know that, hey, I can spend $100 on Facebook ads and get $500 in, in sales back, something like that. Once you have it figured out, you have your funnel figured out you have the ability to then buy growth. And as a consultant, as a coach, I have seen so many business owners where they're struggling, they're making mistakes, not just with marketing, but with, uh, with growth, with hiring new team members, with building that next product, uh, offering a new service. They're struggling and they're making mistakes when it really all boils down to one thing, and that's you don't know how to get more sales. You're scared to say, add that new employee and add that expense of that new employee because well, you know now I'm doubling my expenses. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to double my sales. So then people end up making all sorts of mistakes. Uh, they end up being cheap about things. Uh, they take forever to do things. When in reality, if you just had your marketing figured out, you would have the confidence to make that right hire, as an example, hire the right person, uh, onboard them and know that, hey, once I add that person, I can then increase my marketing, do some more Facebook ads, do some more Google ads, whatever, and double my sales or triple my sales. I have the ability to buy growth. So it sounds to uh, me like some of the, the common mistakes then, they're not really like traditional business mistakes as such. It's more like a mindset issue about like they can't envisage a future whereby like their their income far out exceeds their outgoings. Yeah, it, it really comes down to fear. Uh, and, and then what happens is you, you kind of make excuses. Well, I can't find the right, and I keep going back to this hiring a you know, person, but yeah, I can't find the right person or I can't find the right solution or, you know, all the people, uh, de- dealing in the digital marketing space, uh, I've, I've dealt with say, uh, web design companies where they, they go out and they hire this cheap developer. Because because they want to they want to they don't want to increase their expenses a lot, but they still want to hire a developer to you know help them out with their workload. Well, then that developer produces crappy work because they're p- paying them rock bottom prices, right? Well, if you had just spent the money and hired the right person and onboarded the right team member, or went out and found a service provider that does the the, the work the right way. You, you would have avoided all these problems. But the reason that people actually aren't doing that is because they want to, they want to be cheap about it because they're scared. They have fear about, you know, where am I going to get more sales? 
And if you just have the marketing figured out, you can make the cash register ring. You want to ramp up, you want to double your business, just double your marketing expenses. It's that easy. I think that's right. I mean, we have um, we have something in the UK called apprentice apprenticeship. So we get apprentices mm-hmm. who come through very green. They're, they're not very good at sort of, you know, very, very like sponges. They're desperate to learn, but they, yeah. uh, and we did this in our old um, web design days. So we, we, I ran a web design agency for 12 years and we, we used to take on um, these very green apprentices and they were great. They were cheap, but the amount of time it used to take to train them up to get stuff done. And they would do it in half the time that we, you know, trained professionals or a web designer could actually do it or an experienced web designer could do it in. And so we worked, when we looked at it, it might be 15K a, a year to hire a, an apprentice versus say 36K to take on a, an experienced web developer. But the 15K person could only generate about 30 grand's worth of income for the business. The experienced mm-hmm. person on the other hand could produce 100 or even 150,000 revenue for the business. Yeah. So hiring for skills is definitely the way forward. The other thing which I took from that as well, Dylan, was um, you, and I think you've alluded to this, but it's the things which got us to six figures are not going to get us to seven figures. And that is actually a marketing problem, being able to market and sell a higher ticket priced item. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If if you're uh, at a premium price point, uh, you definitely makes makes scaling your business a lot easier. But, But something you said there actually stands out to me when it that's six to seven figures. I like to say to people that it is easier to 10 X your business than it is to two X your business. And this is especially critical for those that are like at that beginning stage, you know, maybe doing 50, 60, a hundred thousand dollars a year. It is easier to go from that to 800, 900, a million a year than it is to go from say 75 to 150. The reason is that when you are sitting there and you're thinking, oh, okay, I want to double my business this year. Last year I made 75,000, I want to make 150 this year. You 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 just end up thinking, well, I just need to do a little bit more of what what I was doing last year. I just need to, you know, I was going to conferences. Remember what those were like before COVID? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, good people? industry events. <laughs> yeah, yeah, where you would actually like get in a room with multiple people and be close to them like for you know not six feet apart you'd be close to multiple this strange people. world you speak thing. of dylan <laughs> yeah i know it was <laughs> back in the <laughs> medieval days uh but so okay so that's say uh that's how you get your clients you go to industry events and, and that's that's where you end up getting your clients well you end up thinking well, okay well i did two a month well if i just do four a month i'll be able to double my sales well, if you're thinking, okay, I want to 10x my business. I want to go from 75,000 a year to 750,000 next year. Well, you, you start to realize, okay, I can't go to 20 industry events a month. Like that, that's just not possible. So then you start to think outside the box. You start to think in terms of what can I do differently, not what can I do more of. So it is definitely easier to 10x your business than it is to 2x. And one of the things you mentioned as well is about sh- like showing your value. Um, mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, there's, there's one understanding your capacity and your ability to be able, like, how do you grow your business? But most people are very fearful around kind of actually one shouting about how good they are and actually, you know, then showing, showing up in the world as a high value like not even a commodity at this point, the opposite of a commodity. So yeah. h- how do you s- start to encourage your clients to stop ho- hiding behind like low prices? So what I tell people is you, you have to realize um, a, a mistake I see is that people try to go into the market thinking uh, they, they they tend to understand the whole niching thing where, okay, I, I want to only help say, uh, dentist's office. Okay. Cause I'm going to the dentist later this afternoon. I want to, I want to only do digital marketing for dentists, but you have to realize that sure you're, you're, you're niched down into a specific industry, but there is not a service that you can offer that 100% of dentist offices are going to want to use, whether it's, you know, web design, uh, some kind of coaching, consulting, some kind of digital marketing service like I offer, you're not going to be able to offer a service that all of them want. There is, you want to focus on the the small percentage of the market, which might only be five, 10% of the market that is looking to invest in their business and, and basically pay for growth. They're looking 
to spend the money to grow their business. Uh, those people tend to be willing to pay higher prices. They're paying a premium price because they're looking for a solution. They're not looking for the, yeah. the cheapest option out there on the market. And it's, I think if, if everybody was doing the same, if like 100% of the market had Dylan working for them, for example, no mm-hmm. dentists have, a, have the unfair advantage. Yeah. <laughs> now, because everybody's got the same, like, and so if, if dentists are out there fighting over patients to come through into their clinic, like it, it you know, we, we, you need diversity in terms of products and services which are available and the results which they deliver. Um, uh, and people naturally, they think, they, don't, they always think it's I, the best way to compete is on price. Just be the cheapest option out there. But the truth is, is that even if you were free, like you, you were to offer, I will build a website for free for a dental office. No, uh, there's no catch. I'm going to build you a website for free. There's still a percentage of the market that won't go with that because they want the best of the best, or they want an extremely unique design. Uh, this could be, it could also be digital marketing services, anything. There was a certain percentage of the market that even if you were absolutely free, they won't go with you. Uh, so you want to focus on the percentage of the market that is looking to pay a premium price for a solution. Uh, and then those people end up 99.9% of the time. They're better to deal with. Uh, they don't haggle on price. They don't care how much time you are actually spending on their business. They care about getting a result. They are looking for a solution uh, to to grow their business, to make their business better, or to make it run more efficiently, uh, you don't want to be focusing on the uh, on on trying to think in terms of oh, what service can I offer that a hundred percent of the market will will want? Because the truth is, there there is no solution that a hundred percent of the market will want. And and how do you go about identifying that that five or ten percent then? Because you can't just go and poll all of the you know, all of the market and say, right, who's got the most amount of money and then pick off the top five or 10%, you know, off a leaderboard. Like how, how do you actually, what, how do they show up? Uh, I, I think we're, this comes down to niche research uh, and, and just kind of knowing your niche, knowing the industry that you're, you're working in. Uh, as, as an example of one of the industries that I work in, one of the verticals that I'm in is plumbing and heating companies here in the United States. And there's a, I just knew a couple people in that industry. And I knew that uh, most plumbing and heating companies are looking for install projects, not repair projects. Uh, And just knowing things like that, when I would be looking for new clients, when I would reach out to those potential clients, uh, just knowing that little bit of the market allowed, allowed me to segment into the certain part of the market that was looking to grow, looking to invest, to get more install projects. Does that make sense? Absolutely. A hundred percent. Whatever your niche is, this comes into where you need to know more about your niche, more about your industry and just simply do the niche research. So how did you, um, where did you start? What's, what's your story? How did you get into, um, into doing what you do? Uh, well, (laughs) my very first business was actually, uh, flipping flipping uh cell phones on on ebay uh this is back when i was uh 14 or so uh and for me it was uh this was just the right time because this was i know facebook didn't exist at the time so this was you know 2003 2004 but it was the infancy of google ads at the time so back then you could get clicks for like three or four cents it was just it was the wild west it was absolutely ridiculous uh but when i got into business when i started you know thinking about you know this is the route i want to go down uh it was just the hot thing was, was marketing. Uh, this digital marketing thing was just a game changer for businesses because you mean to tell me you could target specific people. Uh, you could target people that are already searching for my type of business. That was just, 
earth shattering to the business world. I'm uh, smiling here because we, do you know what? Funny enough, we had similar side hustles actually. So um, I was a little yeah. bit older than you by the looks of it, but um, 2001, 2002, um, my first business was actually selling, it was a side hustle because I had a job at the same time, but I was selling um, grade two listed laptops. Okay. So which sounds a little bit dodgy, but essentially what it was, the laptop would go, like the hard drive would fail or a disk drive would fail. So, and it was okay. all modular, it was Fujitsu. So they would unplug the old disk drive, plug a new one in. It's basically brand new. Yeah. But these these specific laptops, this is, goes back to what you're saying about you, you know, niches are in the riches, people. Um, like that, that five to 10 percent. So these laptops, they were um, specialist Fujitsu tablets. Do you think tw- this is 20 years ago? A tablet, right? Flip screen, you could twizzle it round. They, they were used on construction sites because they were so rugged, right? So yeah. I used to buy them, this pound sterling, I don't know what the dollar equivalent w- would have been then, but 500 pounds. And I used to flip them and sell them for 5K each. Wow. And a construction site <laughs> would buy 5, 10, 20. I think the biggest deal I ever did was for 40 laptops. Obviously, they got a discount for bulk buying. but um, yeah. And that was so much fun. I remember one summer I made about 40 grand. But the thing is then, and probably this happened with you with the phones as well, because the market then gets flooded over a very short period of time. You know, transporter container ship comes over from China with a whole <laughs> truckload of Fujitsu laptops. Lo- the market prices gets dropped. With grade two, and literally it went from, I mean, the thing is like this, this, sounds dumb right dylan i could still sell them and double my money right mm-hmm. i didn't want to because i was used to like making 10 you times like 10x on it, yeah. right um, so then i started looking out for all these different opportunities and then the prices just kept on falling and then it just really wasn't worth it by that point um yeah. and i never i didn't find another opportunity but that was at the point when i was like actually i need a grown-up business now not flipping stuff and actually do <laughs> like set up my marketing agency at that point so it's actually and it's really rare that i hear somebody who had like an ebay or a, uh, like a google ads story part that's not Gary V from like 2002 <laughs> how how old were you back then how old are you now uh, I at the time I was 21 so um I, I was finishing up my degree I was um I'd been in a, a job as well at the same time for about two or three years so um, gotcha yeah a l- little bit older <laughs> so so what happened for me uh so so what what it was uh at the time I, I don't know why this was but Europe <laughs> You guys had all like the good, the the pre-smartphones. Uh, I remember Sony Ericsson was a company yep. that they made the, like these big bulky cell phones, but like you could get your email on your cell phone. <laughs> or you could, there was like an internet browser, like this was game changing stuff, right? So Europe had all the good cell phones. Uh, and we just had like the Nokia brick ones. And I wanted one for some reason, and I found this. Uh, ended up finding this wholesale company. Uh, it was some based somewhere in Europe, and I signed up, and they just approved me for some reason. That they approved me as a wholesaler, so I was able to get the phones for pretty much what retailers were were able to get them for in in Europe ship them to the United States and then, then flip them on eBay. I wasn't getting 10 X. So I think, yeah, if, if I sold like a $400 phone, I was probably paying like 200 bucks once I got it shipped here and paid all the, the fees to get it here and whatnot. What happened for me is, uh, they, they found out it probably lasted for a year and then they went to go send me my tax form and they found (laughs) out I was, uh, under the age of 18. So my merchant account shut me down. So I couldn't process credit cards. (laughs) (laughs) That was, uh, I I think I made like maybe 20 to 30 grand that, that first year or something like that. But I was hooked, man. I absolutely loved it. And and I had played around with Google ads at the time in which it was just, it's hard to describe like how, how different it was back then than what it is now. It was, it was just it was so just, cheap. It was like the land of opportunity, though. And there was, um, I always tell this story, you know, um, dawn of the internet age 30 years ago, 31 years ago now, you know, there was there was a tenth of the, um, yeah, a tenth of the number of businesses registered as there are today. So mm-hmm. you had all these great opportunities coming to us now that the internet had opened up. But 
um, you know, a te- like no competition, like every, everything now. And I think this is one area where people struggle so much with marketing is like every industry now is so overly saturated. And not mm-hmm. only that, but like when we were marketing those businesses in 2002, 2003, 2004, well, Facebook only came back in 2003. That was, a, that was when he built the first iteration. Oh, yes. of the, Facebook ads were not a thing. <laughs> Facebook yeah. ads didn't exist. Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, Clubhouse, all of these like apps just didn't exist or they the ones that did like youtube was rubbish because like people had such terrible bandwidth on the internet right yeah but nobody could watch videos <laughs> no <laughs> but you could upload them and you could take half a day to, to download one and then and then eventually stream it but you know um my point here is that there was uh w- now people think that marketing is easy because we've got this global marketplace at our fingertips but the reality is um it's actually made it super easy to get online and but there's 10 times the amount of competition so it's 10 times harder to get found yeah and i think yeah. people underestimate that and that means that the ones that are going to stand the test of times are the ones who get super good at automation super good at systems and scaling they get good at gathering social proof so case studies reviews testimonials and they mm-hmm. can find a way to automate that and then all of that like elevates their price point you know because they yep. have this now established credibility and authority in their industry all of that I also think it's takes critical time. That certainly does it. And I think with the competition and how saturated, especially the coaches and consultants and everything, there's a lot out there and anybody can can start that, which is fantastic. This is where I think niching down is just, just absolutely critical. If you're just a general business coach, business consultant, you're going to really struggle because – a 10,000 other guys are doing the same thing. But if you specifically help a certain type of business and you're able to talk about their problems, uh, like I mentioned the plumbing and heating companies, how just knowing that, hey, you don't want repair projects, you want install projects. Like you're speaking their language. Yeah. Uh, and you can't, you can't really get into that with multiple different industries and multiple different niches. Uh, so the, the more niche down, the more specific you get, the more narrow, the, the better. And, and that, that's how you differentiate yourself in the market today. When, when was it that you kind of realized that? When did you know? Because um, reading your profile, it sounds like you had a number of different business projects on the go after the phone flipping thing, kind of that, that, <laughs> yeah. that you, got, you got caught out. Uh, and, you know, so you, so that you had, you had a, there was a turning point where you must have had to start to focus, not necessarily niche at that point, but certainly focus your efforts. Mm-hmm. Was, that, was that a learning point which said, actually, it's not just focus on what I'm doing, but focus on who I'm actually doing it for? Uh, I mean, that was, that was probably one of the more life-changing events of my life uh, was, was just cutting all the crap that I was working on and just focus on one single business. Uh, I did, uh, one thing I, I do encourage people to do is, especially if you're just starting out, is you may, if, if there's say like two or three industries that maybe you know a little bit about, go ahead and try all, you know, all three or four or five in the beginning, just to kind of see like, where can I get some bites? Uh, where, where, who can I seem to help the most? Uh, so that's that's one thing I did when I decided to just focus on on the agency. I did go ahead and and branch out into a couple different niches just to see like who can I help the most. Uh, but but yeah, I, I I think once you've once you figure out your specific niche, kind of stick to that and get better and better, uh, and then you'll be able to raise your prices and you become the premium solution provider. But but yeah, once I it was kind of a it happened both at the same time. I decided to just focus on the agency, decided to just focus on the digital marketing services. Uh, and then I also, uh, once I got through the, the you know, three or four different niches, just focused on two mostly. So the key thing I, I picked out of that is this idea about um, uh, testing and validating against a hypothesis. So we're going to, we think that we can Fail probably fast. help. Yeah, that's it. We, I think we can help these three or four different um, audiences, but hey, at least um, let's, you know, rather than imagine, yeah, well, 
pr- try and predict it. Let's go out and gather some hard and fast data that backs up our hypothesis. And, you know, it might be that this one converts at 20%, this one converts at 30%, this one converts at 45%, but it's low margin. So we need to go with that one in the middle. Um, Absolutely. Too many business yeah. owners get really caught up and is trying to plan and perfect everything before they, like, before they actually launch and start making money. I'm like, go and pitch it to 10 people. Come back and tell me when you've sold to. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is by far the biggest mistake I made. I, after you know, I failed with the, the the cell phones and everything, I just spent 10, 11, 12 years of my life bouncing around, getting nowhere because every, I'm a natural perfectionist. Like, like my house is perfect and everything is like clean and, and organized and everything. And I was the exact same way with my business. Everything had to be perfect before I would actually go out there into the marketplace and say, try to sell people uh, or try to get customers or whatnot. So I would spend years, years of my life making sure I had the logo and then I had the blog was up and then I had content and then I had the website was perfect. And then I had the business card and I had the the stationery. wasted all this time trying to get things to be perfect. Uh, and then I would go out into the marketplace and nobody would want the, the product or service that happened all the time. It is well, now I, feel I, I bit, teach I feel people. a bit sad for you, Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of time it was a painful like we time. have this thing the tiniest violin i'll just play that play a little tune for you just thank you, know. you. I, I need i need that <laughs> uh but now i teach people like especially because tools are just so good now like literally like tonight uh, go out say you're you know we were talking about web design earlier say you're a web design agency go out tonight and and build say four landing pages for four different industries or niches that you think you can help. Uh, And then tomorrow, work on trying to reach out to those businesses and get them to come to that landing page and and see who can you actually help. Like within one week, you should be able to answer that question. And it doesn't take a massive amount of investment. Uh, You could, like I, to this day with my agency, I use Squarespace. Like that's it. Like that's, that's what I use for my website. It's like, what, $17 a month or something? Uh, you know, just build the landing page, get, get things out there. You want to fail as quickly as possible. Uh, since you know, you, know, uh, you know, we're talking to a lot of coaches and consultants here, another thing, I, I, I say take it a step further, and I like to say uh, sell before you ever build. So if you have... So you're, you're doing a web design agency or you're a, a coach who has a training program or something like that. Don't build out the ultimate version of your training program or know how to build the website and or do the digital marketing service or consult a certain industry before you ever sell somebody in that industry. Like get the cash register to ring, get somebody to actually give you money from that particular industry from that particular niche, and then figure out how to actually deliver the product or service. It's, it's almost like you've done your research on me because I, I, I did exactly that. So with the coaching practice, I mean, I, I've been running it since 2016, but um, mm-hmm. we one-to-one, started out one-to-one, did six figures in the first year, six figures again in the second year. And then I got lots of clients very quickly and thought, I, this is getting a little bit too busy. So I switched to a group format. But, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I see so many coaches make this, this mistake, which I didn't do, um, I'll add, but go out, they build their full like learning platform platform and take spend months like creating these wonderful videos and the workbooks and all this sort of stuff and I was like no stop that I'm just gonna go and um uh like go into my group and I built up an audience of about 800 people by this point so um so I went into my group and I pitched this I like over two weeks sent various emails out and things like that just went through the launch sequence and I sold 30 people onto my first cohort of the group program awesome Awesome. yeah it was awesome and then so now it's like November 2018 I've collected all this money and and uh and uh, my wife's like, well, when are you going to start? And I was like, well, it starts on January the 1st. He's like, cool. So when are you going to build it? And I was like, ah, yeah, good point. Got to build the damn thing now. Yeah. So literally I, I locked myself in um, my office in town, which I don't have any more const- um, uh, uh, now working from home and stuff. So I ditched it, but um, locked myself in the office for four days between Christmas uh, and New Year. And I built the whole damn thing. And then we launched mm-hmm. it on um, January the 1st. And I thought up here, if I'd listened to this, it was going... 
this is a terrible idea. All of these videos are rubbish. Nobody's going to like them. Nobody's, everybody's going to get really shit results. You know, I had all of that. I'm the fearless business coach, still the fear kind of rattling around in my head. And then of course we launch it and everybody's like, this is amazing. This is brilliant. This is like, never seen anything like it. Like, yeah. they, like the feedback was great. And the, and I, I said, listen, be honest. If there's stuff you either think that you want to see, or there were several questions which kept on coming up over and again, like time and again, like, um, avatar was a, a big one. Who's your ideal client avatar that kept on coming up in every coaching course. I was like, right, I need a module on this three modules out of 80 videos, which I put together. That's all we had to add into it. Um, and I think if I'd waited, it could have, it would have taken me months, if not years to actually pull together that content before I had the confidence mm -hmm. to do it. And it, now I tell people just, to, just JFDI, just fucking do it. Just launch it. Just fucking do it. Yeah. And, and you, uh, because of that time constraint, you ended up focusing on the absolute critical few things uh, and let go of the trivial many and really narrow down on what the what you needed to provide. Like, these are the things that I absolutely need to provide. And then you also mentioned you 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 went you asked the people, be honest. I think that honesty part is is critical. Be, you know, tell people like, hey, you know, I just launched this. Please tell me what you what you need the best feedback you can get from the marketplace is actual people telling you, this is what I need. Uh, you can only guess what you think the marketplace can need. So by building just the most basic version of that product, that service, that course, uh, and then telling people, okay, so I know how to provide this solution. Here's the solution. What else do you think you need? Sometimes you're going to get it right, but more often than not, like you, you mentioned, there was a few videos that you needed to add to give people that extra little bit of value. How long would have you spent building that out, wasting your time? Uh, and you probably would have overbuilt it or yeah. you might have still missed those three videos and not included that. I also know a lot of people who they will spend years building out their program and then they go to sell it and they find out that nobody actually wants it. <laughs> yeah. That's the worst thing you can do. Uh, and we're not tricking people here. Uh, but what's what's like interesting though, Dylan, is about the, like, the reason why people do procrastinate and not launch. So one, there's the fear, fear of failure. And, and yeah, well, it's, it's basic fears. But um, yeah. I, met, I met a really interesting guy uh, once who was building out a software app that if, effectively it took a 3D um, photo of your body. It was a fashion, mm -hmm. pro, fashion app. So it would then dress you in, once it had a, a 3D version of your body, it would dress you in the clothes that they made, the outfit. It's a really smart piece of kit. And they, they were starting to develop like virtual reality versions of it and all this sort of stuff. And I, I said to him, like, it sounds like you put so much effort into this. And like, how long have you been doing this for? And he's like, three and a half years. It's like, oh, this is amazing. You must have loads of customers. He's like, um, no, we've got, got none. I was like, why haven't uh, you got any customers? Have you got any, anybody on beta? Have you tested this? And he's like, no, we haven't even tested it properly yet. It's like, I was like, so when are you going to launch then? When it, it's like, well, no, we're not, we're not, I don't want to launch it yet. It's not ready. But it transpired. And I think this is quite a, a key learning here. Um, unfortunately, his parents had passed away very recently in a car crash. Um, uh, sort of, you know, and he inherited a load of money. He'd mm -hmm. because of the accident, he left his job, and now he's got all this money. He wanted, he had he had this thing about fashion, yeah. And um, it, it was it was weird. It's like because it was his parents' inheritance that he he'd he got. Didn't want to fail. He wanted this product to be perfect, and I was like, that is that's about as complex as you can get a reason for not launching. Um, and all he was worried about was just letting his parents down. It was their legacy. And, and I just said to him, listen, what do you think they would want you to do? Do you, do you think they would want you this to be successful? And he's like, yeah. How would you define that success? He's like, well, I don't know. It would be, it would be live. There would be people buying my products and there'd be people wearing my jackets, and my trousers and stuff. I was like, you're actually letting your parents down by not spending their money and not like giving this thing a shot. Yeah. And that was like, it, honestly, it couldn't have been more complex than that. But what other things do you tend to see that stop people from actually like, we've got to do this? Well, it's, it's 100%. Uh, I mean, it, it's, it definitely comes down to fear. Uh, another thing is because people get, you get personally attached to your business. It's your baby. You want it to be perfect. And one of the things I commonly see is uh, people will look at other businesses or 
uh, we're on a podcast right now. They'll look at uh, they'll look at other podcasts and they'll be like, I want my podcast to be like this. I'm niched down or I have this specific industry that I'm helping, but I want it to look like this. And they end up looking at the, the biggest shows in the industry or they look at other consultants who are extremely successful and they see their website and they see this and they see that. And what people just fail to realize is that you're not looking at the first version. Yeah. You're looking at the, the 50th iteration in that. If, if you're looking at, at podcasts, um, if you look at like the big shows, like, uh, like the Joe Rogan show, do you guys follow Joe yeah. Rogan? Over uh, there? Joe Rogan, I've, I've never, I have never looked at John Lee Demas's um, podcast on uh, Entrepreneurs on Fire uh, and yeah. thought I want some of that in my life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, I think he's on like he's probably on like episode a thousand, right? Three thousand. Yeah, ridiculous amount. You're listening to the three thousandth version. Your first version will never be as good as his 3000th version. But the only way that you can get to that 50th iteration or the 100th iteration or the 1000th iteration is by doing the first one. Yeah. So you want to get there as quickly as possible. Uh, this is especially important when it comes to, you know, creative putting content out there, uh, videos, things like that. Like if you if you're putting out uh, we were talking pre-show about about uh, video marketing and whatnot, putting out YouTube videos. Uh, you know, people will look at these videos that get a million views or whatnot and be like, oh man, that's amazing. Like that would be great if I can do that for my business. But you have to realize like, that's probably that guy's like 400th video that you're looking at. He didn't start that good or she wasn't that great in the beginning. The only way they got that good is by continuously doing it, continuously putting out better iterations and just continuously improving. Uh, so the best thing to do is just get it out there as fast as possible. Yeah, totally agree. Couldn't agree more. And I'm, I'm a big fan of um, Eric Reese's The Lean Startup as well. If anybody wants a book on the principles of kind of feed, feedback that, cycles, that right over like there. That. <laughs> it, uh, it was uh, The Lean Startup was actually the second business or entrepreneurship book, which I read when I started to get into personal development, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I did the very typical thing. I, I left school and then thought, I don't ever have to learn and read a book again. So of I, course. I stopped for yeah. years. And then uh, midway through my business, you know, with the agency, I was like, probably need a bit of help with this. I started listening to audiobooks, but I picked up Eric Reese's Lean Startup. And then my first book is still on the this, this shelf behind me, Built to Sell by a guy called John Warlow, who's another great consultant, sold uh, I several. I, heard of that. I like your bookshelf back there. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a bit out of focus, soft focus with this camera, but uh, no, that's, that's very kind. Got yeah, my, you, can't, got my you can't see mine. VW yeah. Camper over there. I've got my Range Rover, which, you know, on that shelf. And I've got a few other things. So this is kind of like my dream shelf, really, of like, and pictures of the family and stuff. But um, so you mentioned about like, um, so kind of iterating fast, but obviously that's a part mm -hmm. of your process that you help your clients go through. What, what, what are the kind of typical steps which you take your clients through in terms of when, when you're preparing them and taking them through scaling? So, uh, the main thing that I that I teach students is is fail as fast as possible, uh, get things out quickly, um, because most of the time, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about me and my perfectionism and how you had to have the business card, you had to have the stationery and the nice logo and stuff like that. I I I really teach students like I tell my story of like I went through all this. 12 years of pain trying to be a perfectionist. And then I decided I'm going to go as hard as I can in the other di direction. So I, I had a seven figure agency with no logo, no website, no professional voiceover system, none of that stuff. But I did have all that stuff with the multitude of failed businesses that came before. So, uh, so I tell people, you know, realize like that, you know, you don't need all that stuff and you want to set yourself, uh, you know, deadlines. So, uh, when I'm having students go through my program, I, like I tell them, and I highly encourage all coaches and consultants out there to, to do this. Deadlines are absolutely critical for getting your students, uh, or the business owners you're working with to, to take action. So like I tell people, 
like the first week, uh, you know, you're going to want a website, you're going to want a name, you're going to want an email system and things like that. Okay. You're doing that tonight. Like tonight, that's the action step. I want you to do that tonight. Nice. Uh, by setting those deadlines, uh, then you you cut out, okay, I'm going to spend a week or two weeks or a month building out my website. Like, no, you're building it tonight. I don't even think you need it, but you're going to want it. You're going to, you're going to be more confident when you jump on a sales call with somebody. So build it tonight. Uh, I, I really think the, the, the simple solution was just simply having deadlines. Did that answer your question? I don't even <laughs> yes, went off there. It's kind of just getting an, an insight into kind of like how you encourage, like how you work with your clients basically and how you encourage them to sort of scale their agencies. Um, so that I think that's given us a, a very good insight actually around sort of, um, you know, uh, don't be afraid of failing, like iterate as fast as you can and get stuff done quickly because that gives you the fastest opportunity to test stuff basically. One other thing is the group element. Uh, people don't like to fail publicly. So I, I tell, I tell people like I'm beating into them, like go post on Facebook, uh, go, you know, when we jump on a, a, a weekly group call or something, I want you to tell me what's going on in your business. So next week I can be like, Hey, Hey John, did you do such and such thing? because you're not going to want to publicly admit that you failed. So that accountability is another critical thing to kind of push people to, it's just like you, whenever you, uh, you know, you told people January 1st or whatever, we're starting, well, you couldn't fail because you know, that would, you, you already have people that gave you money or, or you told people I'm delivering this to you by such and such date. So it forces you, uh, you have that, that accountability and you have the deadline you're not going to fail if you have those two things. The, I love Absolutely. the fact there's like penalties as well for not um, not getting the job done. You know, you don't want to publicly admit this. A friend of mine, we were, we were sharing on a mastermind about what are good motivators. And somebody told us this story about how he had a bit of a bet with a friend of his. They had to, I think it was getting, um, getting the first manuscript done for their book. So the first version of their book done. And mm -hmm. um, they, they, they were trying to come up with various penalties. And one was, well, if you miss a deadline, you've got to give some money to charity. Or if you've got to miss the deadline, you've got to give me some money. And then they, what they came up with was like, who do you absolutely detest in the entrepreneurial space? Okay, what's going to happen is, and I'll take the money off you now, but if you don't finish your manuscript by this date, I'm going to give them the $500. And it was like, he was like, I'm, I don't want them to have my money. I'm going to, and he got the manuscript done. You know? <laughs> yeah, it'll kick you in the ass so that you don't do it. No, that's an extremely powerful, I have, uh, I've never <clears throat> told anybody this. There are two, two friends of mine that have, significant checks that I have written them. Uh, and if I do certain things in my life, which I won't say what, but if I, if I do certain things or, or break bad hat or I say, go back on bad habits, uh, they are allowed to cash those checks. Nice. Uh, so literally like I write it out to them. I, I put the dollar amount and I sign it and you know, I have some of theirs too. Uh, and it's just like this personal development thing where I, I don't want to lose that money. I've, I've already written the check. So if I fail and I do this, uh, this person's going to be able to cash this check. Uh, that accountability will will push you in the right direction like 100% of the time. Oh, I totally agree. Oh, gosh, I'm really I'm afraid we've got to wrap up, Dylan. We've come to kind of oh, the yeah, end of the, the, the show. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> honestly, I could sit here and talk with you for hours. So um, listen, if people want to, what are you working on at the moment? Um, I understand you've got a, a six-step download that, um, that you share on your, your website. Yeah. So right now, my, my main focus is my education business, which is uh, ran under my personal name, my website's DylanOgline.com. I do have a free ebook. People can check it out. It's just uh, six steps to a six-figure agency. Uh, you can go to my website, DylanOgline.com uh, slash six, all spelled out S-I-X, and uh, put your email in and uh, get the ebook. Nice. And uh, we'll also share, you've given us your LinkedIn and Twitter accounts um, and Instagram as well. So we'll make sure we share those in the show notes so people can get hold of you. Uh, slight curveball now, Dylan. Probably should have warned you about this pre-roll, but um, I've got a question for you. Um, far away. We're going we're gonna to jump into the fearless business time machine. Um, I always say to people, it's a bit like the DeLorean on Back to the Future, but slightly better and less Iranians. 
hanging around with guns. You know, I've never watched that movie. Have you not? You get the concept. I though. know what the story is. Yes, yeah. but sorry, I'm I messed up. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. So you're gonna you get to punch the date into the DeLorean, and we're gonna go back to a year in your past, and you're gonna have a okay. word with Dylan X minus however many years, okay, or T minus X years. Um, so when is it, and what would you say to him? Uh, it would be. Um, it's 2005, say, 2005, 2006, uh, whenever I was young. Uh, I had just, just dropped out of high school, and I was ambitious, and my work ethic was my, – my, I thought my work ethic could solve everything. So I can – there's no reason I can't have 10 businesses going at the same time. I'll work 100 hours a week, no problem. Uh, so I would uh, go back and tell that young man – to uh, focus, focus on on just one single thing. Get really good at it. You can't. Uh, uh, there's a proverb, I believe, uh, that uh, the man who chases two rabbits catches none. Uh, well, if you chase ten, you're certainly not going to catch any. <laughs> so, <laughs> not so with, don't. Not focus. without a few border collies helping you and a few greyhounds chasing them as well. But um, you would, if I just have one word, it would just be focus. It would yeah. just. Focus. But I think I think um, to offer that younger Dylan a, a little bit of advice. It sounds to me like you needed to go through that painful process and work all those hours and try out all those projects in order to get to where you are now. So, if you had just focused on one and it hadn't worked out and you'd lost. Uh, your ambition as a result of that because you don't know what you might have how you might have reacted you mm-hmm. might not have created anything that you've got since it's like sliding doors you could be in a completely different I, I I 100% agree with that I I, I don't th- I don't think it's a good idea to look back on the past yeah it's <laughs> and, always and, I only and, ask the question because it's always interesting yeah, to see yeah. what people come up with you know yeah, no, I, uh, but I, I don't, I don't regret it. I don't think, um, like you said, I, I don't, I don't think I would have lost my ambition, but I, uh, I needed to go as, I think it took all, I hate that I wasted so much time, but I, I'm a natural perfectionist. I've been a perfectionist since I was a young child. Uh, and I, I think I needed to fail over and over and over again for it to, be beat into me that I need to go the other way and not be a perfectionist yeah. and, and be on, be comfortable with the messiness of, of building a business of, you know, getting some success going. It's not this perfectionist thing. It's uh, it's, it's messy. And yeah. I, yeah, I agree. I don't think I would have, I don't think I would have learned the lesson had I just been told to focus on one single thing back. Yeah. Then. I would probably say that and buy some Amazon stock. So probably, <laughs> <laughs> probably a good idea. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, I've always thought, you know, I was building websites for other people in 2004 and, and uh, I should have bought, you know, apparently the, I think a $5,000 uh, investment in Facebook in 2005 or six is, was, would have been worth something like 130 billion oh. in today's money. <laughs> it's just, it's nuts, isn't it? When you think about it, but Hey, I, I have a, a good friend who <clears throat> invested, uh, He's about 10 years older than me. And I don't know when, maybe sometime in the late nineties, he bought uh, like $5,000, $10,000 worth of, of Apple. And last time I talked to him, he was like, if I, if he would have held it, it would have been worth like 20 to 30 million. Uh, But he didn't hold it. He, he, he like doubled or tripled his money, but Yeah, it, it's incredible when you when you look back at those things. Or like Bitcoin, I would have told myself to buy some Bitcoin, like <laughs> yeah. take everything you got and put some Bitcoin. Stack up uh, twenty gazillion computers and mine a, sh- a shed ton of just, Bitcoin. Yeah, just <laughs> get all the Bitcoin you can. Put every penny you got into Bitcoin. But there's no reason to. Uh, uh, I when it comes to which I know we got we got to wrap up here, but when it comes to stuff like that, I I wouldn't have had the the uh, the guts to hold it. I, there's no way I, I would have. And yeah. very few people would. If you had bought Bitcoin when it was two cents or whatever it was at the beginning. My, my um, I know what you mean because it's my, my um, uh, what do you call it? My risk aversion when I was in my 20s is very different to what I understand about investing in money now and wealth building Absolutely. and wealth creation now. I'm actually, 
I would say that I'm more, I'm risk averse when it comes to things like cycling down hills at 50 miles an hour. <laughs> when it comes to investments, you understand that you've just got to ride out the storms and you've got to wait for mm-hmm. three to five years to start to get those returns. But I would have wanted that money like within a day, like 20 years ago. Like now it's like, I don't care. I've got the money. So yeah, yeah. people, uh, I, 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 especially younger people, I get a lot of young people in my, in my, my, training program uh a lot of them are like what do you think the next bitcoin is and i'm like dude there's no reason to even try to guess that because i guarantee you if you had bought bitcoin at 10 cents you would have sold it like two dollars yeah there's no way you would have held bitcoin you, until you put, it was if you 50, got 10k ten thousand dollars put it into your own business that's the best investment yeah the best make. investment is is if in you your believe business, in yourself in yourself uh and then if you have extra cash invest it in broad market index funds and yeah. just invest in the market. Uh, don't try to pick things because listen, you don't have it in you. Very, very, very few people have it in them to hold Bitcoin from five cents to, to 50,000. So yeah. you're absolutely not going to do that. So it's better to just uh, invest in yourself. That's the absolute best investment you can make. And then any extra cash you have, just invest in the markets and broad market index yeah. funds. So. Who knew we were going to be giving financial advice? By the Actually, way, yeah, I, I must gotta, I, I add the uh, the disclaimer: I'm not a financial it, advisor. Yeah, I am not. Don't listen IFA. to me. <laughs> I have no idea what I'm talking about. You might as well just go burn your money rather than listen to Dylan. <laughs> <laughs> I am no financial. I am not a registered financial advisor. <laughs> I think all people have got to do is watch this video or listen to the recording and they will know that we're not. <laughs> you think they'll have an idea? <laughs> a Go buy clues. lottery tickets, people. Just do that. That's a good idea. <laughs> Amazing. Listen, Dylan, thank you. I really appreciate your time. You've been a fantastic guest. Absolutely, Robin. Thanks so much for having me. Man. 